everyone, and welcome to another edition of our COVID-19 Power Lunch, our weekly video series where we bring you updates on the new legislation and any new developments related to the coronavirus pandemic. I do want to start off today by letting you know that we are transitioning to a weekly format for our video series. A new video will debut every Tuesday at noon. As a reminder, I'm Erin Spivak, partner with James Moore and Company and a moderator of the series. Over the past few months, we've received a lot of human resources questions related to the different legislation from the FFCRA, the CARES Act, and the Paycheck Protection Program. Joining us today for to give us the HR perspective on this legislation is Julie Nicely, the HR Director for James Warren Company. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start off with one of my favorite topics is the Paycheck Protection Program. And I know yeah. now that they've come out with a lot of information related to the forgiveness, we continue to get the HR questions related to it. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest ones I know is, what do I do if an employee refuses to come back or quits um, under the PPP program? Yes, well, a couple of weeks ago, um, the additional guidance came out, which, which said exactly what employers need to do, because they are finding that some people either are refusing to come back because they're making more money on unemployment, potentially, or they are uh, have family circumstance, or they're too afraid to come back, quitting for various other reasons. So the guidance that came out said that as long as you as an employer are making a good faith effort in writing to offer them their job back, or to offer them their job under the same circumstances, same position, same pay, if they refuse to come back, decline the offer, or resign, you won't be penalized for that. So the important part for the employer is just like everything else in the HR world, which I say every time we talk, is if it's not written down, it didn't happen, is you have to make sure that you've put an offer in writing. And what you also want to do is make sure that you get some affirmative response if you can. So even if the employee does come back, make sure that they sign an acknowledgement that says that they understand that they're coming back under the same conditions in the same position for the same pay. And then that won't be held against you um, when it comes to the PPP loan and you want to add anything um, in that way with the forgiveness, please do, you know. Oh yeah, so they actually came out with the interim final rule. So two weeks ago, they came out with the application for loan forgiveness, which we had a webinar on showing you how to calculate and complete that. And then last Friday on May 22nd, they came out with the interim final rule that gave a little bit more detail, still left a bunch of questions, but it gave a little bit more detail in filling out the application. And they gave a couple more caveats related to um, not only if someone refuses to come back, but if you have to terminate somebody for cause, that that mm -hmm. won't hurt you. And they get into, they got into a little bit more frequently asked questions related to um, that it's not just like all on you as the employer, that if there's reasons that employees didn't come back or you had to terminate them for cost, that it won't hurt you in the FGE um, reduction of your forgiveness. And as a reminder, if you restore your FTE, um, your FTE count by June 30th, regardless of what happened during your covered or alternative cover period, you're fine and you don't have a reduction to your loan forgiveness. So I definitely recommend that people go to our website where we have an updated um, link to that interim final rule and certainly soon we will have an article related to how that actually works so that you can get some more clarity on that. Right, and so I think I, I also read, I, I'm sorry, I think I also read in the guidance they did say that, you know, as long as your FTE count is the same, it doesn't have to be the same people. So right. if you have somebody that quits or is um, has left for cause or refuses to come back, you can replace that person with another person and it won't affect your numbers at all, right? Absolutely. And, you know, we're really curious to see, um, especially as a lot of people's eight week period is coming up and as we get into the summer and a lot of restrictions are starting to be lifted and there's a lot more um, capacity opening for stores and restaurants and other businesses, is if by that June 30th that you'll be able to rehire to that FTE a role anyway because you need it hopefully because the economy is doing well and we're able to go back to normal we just don't know at this point right. so but with that said julie i know a lot of them people are still um, very scared to come back to work especially if they're being exposed to a lot of people depending on the type of business that you're in so if they're too scared to come back whether they're high risk or not how does that work with ppp uh so it, it's it's a a question that a lot are having because you do have people that may not be high risk but they're just too scared or they have anxiety issues um or they're you know they just don't want to expose their family members maybe they have elderly family that they take care of and unfortunately there's not one answer 
Um, there is a lot of different regulations at play with, with when you have somebody that refuses to come back. Um, if you look at the OSHA guidance, which they've released a, a 60 page document that provides some additional guidance on all of this. But if uh, under OSHA, and the only way an employee can refuse to come to work is if they feel they are in quote, eminent danger. So how do you define em em eminent danger, which is threat of injury or death, immediate threat of injury or death? Well, does COVID count at that? For some people who are high risk, high, high risk they may feel that way. Um, but generally speaking, someone can't refuse to come back to work unless they have certain conditions. If they are high risk, then you certainly wanna have a conversation. And that's what the government and the regulations are asking for, is make sure you're having a conversation with an employee to determine what can we do and to keep you safe in coming back to work? So are you following the CDC guidance that has been released in the OSHA guidance for the workplace? Are you making sure that everybody is you know, self-certifying before they walk in the door that they have not been exposed? Are you requiring masks? What are you doing about customers? What are you doing about sanitizing the workplace on a regular basis? So that if you and employer are doing everything you can to try to make the the workplace as safe as possible then an employee can't really say well i'm scared i'm going to get it um they might and again you have to look at do they are they in the high risk category if they're in the high risk category then you certainly want to put them in a position where they can be as safe as possible so can they keep teleworking can you keep them at home until we get a little bit farther down the road with this um if they do if it's a position where they really do need to be on site, say a, um, a cashier at a grocery store. If you have somebody who's high risk, you might not wanna put them in, at front helping customers and doing cashiering, but is there a way that you can adjust their job on a temporary basis where maybe they can do uh, restocking or something which might not expose them to as many people um, out in the public? So it's an interactive conversation that you have to have with the employee and you know it's it's kind of it's a difficult thing because on one side we say you know well you really want to treat everybody the same you want to make sure you're giving everybody the same kind of um, um, opportunities and protecting but then the guidance is telling us that you really want to almost do this on a case by case basis because every person's situation is unique yeah. it's a, it's difficult it, it really is just case by case having to have a conversation and figure out what's the best thing we can do to keep the employee safe but also get what we need as an employer. Yeah, has the CDC weighed in on this as far as high risk employees? Yes, the, the CDC has said that if they're recommending, their recommendation is that if you have people that are high risk, try to allow them to continue to work or telework at least until we get into phase three. Um, so depending on what state, what county you're in, I think Alachua, we're still in phase one, I believe. Um, so they're recommending that wait as long as possible if you have somebody that is that is high risk so that you're not putting them in a situation that could risk their health. And certainly the doctors, uh, people's doctors are not gonna want them in a situation where they're exposed to a lot of the public, for example, if they do have those certain conditions. So the CDC is recommending, please try to wait until phase three, if at all possible, or allow them to continue to telework if that's possible, because that's kind of solves a lot of problems if you have employees that can do that and your business is set up to permit that. No, that makes sense. And so as employers are bringing employees back to work, what do they need to be thinking about? Uh, hopefully, um, they're already thinking about and have already started to put a plan in place, um, which needs to be very comprehensive, potentially going in phases, looking at what can we do to protect the workforce? What can we do from a cleanliness standpoint? What protocols do you need to put into place? on a regular basis to make sure that as people start to come back that the, the business is, is clean and sanitized to the best of your ability. Um, that plan, which should be written, should also include what you're going to do with the public or clients or customers that are coming in the door. You need to make decisions as, as your business. Do you want to require employees to use masks if they're in common areas in the business, but they don't need to use it if they're in their workstation or in the office, for example. Um, some employers are considering, do I, do I take temperatures? Do I want every, to take everybody's temperatures when they come into the office in the morning or the workplace every day? And there are some complications with that. So if you're considering doing that, 
make sure you go and look at the Department of Labor guidance and the CDDC guidance in order to make sure that you're doing that in an appropriate way. Um, you also want to make sure that employees are self-certifying. And again, we go back to having something in writing from the employee saying before they walk back in the office that they affirm that they have not been exposed, that they don't have COVID, that maybe they haven't traveled um, internationally in the last 14 days, um, and also get them to attest to the fact that if they should develop symptoms, they will immediately go home and report it. Um, because gosh knows, none of us want to be sitting here, hopefully, in, in, in a few months and having to go through all of this again because we now have another wave coming through. So you want to have that document, you want to have all of your key players in your business participate in that, your facilities people, your operations people, your, your finance people, whoever deals with the customers, your HR people, to put a really comprehensive plan in place, make sure the employees are well aware of what their responsibilities are because it's not only the employer's responsibilities, what does the employee need to do? What kind of precautions do they need to take? Um, and, and those can be very comprehensive. There is about a million examples uh, if you Google around, some better than others, some more complicated than others. So you can do what you think is best for your workforce and your situation. It doesn't have to be overcomplicated, but you wanna make sure that it's comprehensive enough. So there's no question what my responsibilities are, are if I'm an employee and I wanna come back to work on Monday. No, that definitely makes sense. What is it? I'm going to quiz you on this. What do we have in our um, personal policy for James Warren Company? We have three different practices, correct? Like that we're that are we're responsible for. What is it called? Yeah. Like one? What if you can tell better than I can? Oh, you're testing me. Um, I know. So the per personal response. You mean the personal? Yes. Oh, personal. Yeah. No, I don't remember. Yeah. Personal I'm failing the test. I'm failing the test. <laughs> It's okay. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I do know that we, we just have three practices in place that basically said, like, as someone who's coming into the office or the building, that you have your own personal responsibility as well as social responsibility and group responsibility. Yes. I think those are the three, if I'm not mistaken, because part of this is, is as an employee that you need to take on, that you're going to do certain things to keep yourself safe as well. So right. it's not all on the employer. It's on the employer to make yes. the your environment is safe as possible, but the employee does have some responsibility related to it. So, exactly. And, and the last thing you want is somebody who's not feeling well coming into right. the office. And one of the right. other things the CDC has said is it really is important to, mm -hmm. from an employer standpoint, to try to identify those employees who are at high risk. You know, I, I mean, and it's one of these strange balances is that we are told as HR and, H and companies, you know, you don't want to get too involved in people's medical business, right? But then on the other hand, we have a responsibility to try to identify those that are high risk and then work with them in order to put them in a position that they are, um, they're going to be safe. But it make, it's a voluntary situation. So you can request and ask, send something out, send a pulse survey, send something out to the employees saying, hey, you know, we want to make sure that we're taking care of all of our people. If you're in a high risk, risk category, please let one person know or the HR person know so that you can have that conversation with them and figure out what they may need. Because you need to know, do they need to stay home? Are they going to need to stay home for an extended period of time? Um, can they come into the office, but with some accommodations that maybe the doctor can clarify on what they will or will not need? So it's 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 a really um, it's it's a bit of a tightrope that I think a lot of employers are really walking right now on how do we do everything we need to do in order to protect our employees, but we might not have all the information we need. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's really interesting because, like you said, we're not supposed to know everybody's medical history, or sometimes even their social history. Where you might say, "Well, I know that that person is married to an emergency room doctor who deals with COVID every day, so mm -hmm. I know they're more exposed, and that I'm high risk to it." It's just a very interesting dynamic. But I think the bottom line that you said over and over again throughout these different series is, as an employer, you do the best you can with the information you have, right? And paying yes. attention. The DOL to OSHA to the CDC. I mean, you can't protect against everything. Right. So. And one of the one of the interesting things that I, I heard, and not from from this area in Florida that we're in, but in a different part of the country, is one thing that also is also happening is kind of tattling. So um, if an employee is on social media and they went to the beach last weekend or something, then another employee sees that they were at the beach, then that person is coming in and kind of tattling, saying, "Hey." They weren't social distancing at the beach. Right. So how do you handle that? What do you do about that? 
I don't have a really good answer for that one yet. Um, right. And we don't have any guidance on how you handle something like that. Um, right. Other than have a conversation, try to have that conversation and, um, and see what you do with that in order to come up with a solution that's going to be okay for your workforce. It's not a one size fits all. But I thought that was kind of an interesting one. It's like, what do you do if, if someone's not social distancing and they get caught by another employee and that employee now feels threatened by that? I, I know, it's, I know. Hard one. it's so yeah. hard. Yeah. Well, and depending on what state, what county, what city you're in, everybody mm -hmm. has kind of different guidelines of what's allowed, right? So it's kind exactly. of like, it was a break in the law, but yeah, people are feeling unsafe. Yes. So let's kind of pivot to like, as far as people um, are now have been working remotely and that as the, the bans have lifted and the quarantine has kind of started to lift. And so now people are available to come back to work. Some people are saying, hey, I, I really liked working remotely. Mm -hmm. What does an employer need to think about, um, especially given if it has been going well, working remotely or what do they need to do? Well, um, if it's working great, wonderful. I think I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of employers um, that that is absolutely the case. And surprisingly, there are, there are very surprising some cases in how well it's working and they may want to continue this in some fashion. Um, so where do you start? Of course, we always start with a policy. You have to have a policy and you have to have a written agreement because you want to make sure as an employer, you're protecting yourself and those employees because that home environment, that remote location has now become part of your office, right? So you need to make sure that, that you've got the right protocols in place, that you've got safety standards in place for, for workers' comp purposes, for example, who's responsible for what piece of that. You wanna make sure you come to an agreement on what the employer is going to provide for that home office. You know, is it the same setup that they had in, in, in their regular office or are you only gonna provide a laptop, for example, but no printer? Um, are you gonna consider providing a stipend for internet or home, you know, cell phone use or something like that? All those things need to be considered, especially if you're gonna look at doing something more remotely on a, on a more permanent basis. Um, also, you want to make sure that you have the supervision piece handled in there. A regular check-ins, if someone's going to start working, working remotely on a more permanent basis, they might still be dangling out there where 80% of the workforce is in, so they might feel a little more isolated. So you want to make sure that you have some procedures and policies in place on how you will address that, how do you address performance. And one of the other things that's come up is a question um, more recently since all of this, is what do you do if you have hourly employees, non-exempt employees who are working from home? Um, according to the FLSA, you need to make sure that you're paying hourly employees for every moment that they're working. It's a little harder to control when they're home. So you might wanna consider adding a policy or some process that says that you have a curfew on emails, for example. Um, this is happen, it happens all the time. Um, it, you clock off work, you're done with work, and then you're checking your phone at eight o'clock at night. Your boss asks, sends you a couple of emails that you wanna answer really quick. Well, if I'm an hourly employee, I should be putting that time in as time worked. In some cases, employees will do that, and sometimes they won't. Um, the employee's trying to be responsive to their boss and say, hey, they, they sent me an email at eight o'clock at night, but that's work time. So what some employers are starting to do is put together a curfew, make it, make it, make it part of the remote reimbursement or, or the remote um, agreement that says well, you are on, or email and work is curfewed from the time you clock out until the time you clock in the next morning, making sure you emphasize the fact that any work time needs to be recorded as time worked and how that's going to happen. And then you actually have to manage it between the supervisor, the employee, to make sure that they are putting in all of the time that they have. No, that's a really good point. I hadn't even thought about that because, again, everybody has such access from whether it's their own or iPhone or iPad or whatever smart device it is, or, hey, I'm just going to log into my computer real quick because I forgot to do something. And they may think I don't need to log in or clock in the five minutes. And certainly they don't think the employer is being hurt by that, but you don't want the employee to feel like they're not getting paid for what they're doing or to create any sort of issues. And with the right. curfew, this is kind of a nice boundary of, of setting yeah. an expectation too, right? Like we don't yes. expect you to be checking this. Um, you know, and it's probably a good boundary for all of us, isn't it? You know, yeah. and that's one of the downsides of, of working remotely is that you can lose track of time. 
and you can just sit there and you can maybe because you're not getting interrupted as much you just sit there and you keep working and working and working and maybe it's better for us from a mental health standpoint from a work-life balance standpoint that we all have that kind of curfew whether it's formalized or not to say you know what i'm going to shut down and just not look at my email until eight o'clock in the morning what a novel idea right it is a novel idea. Again, you have to have the boundary set. It is actually a really good piece. I do want to um, point out one thing that you said that I think is really interesting is that, is that a lot of people went to um, working from home or teleworking during the COVID-19 crisis of where everybody was forced to be at home and a lot of places shut down, is that it became much more obvious that people could work remotely, but it also became a little easier because everybody was working remotely, right? So you were able, yes. you had to communicate via phone, Zoom, go to meetings however it was going to work for you now that people are transitioning and there is quite a few people who said i need to get back in the office um, whether it be for lots of different reasons and so now it's 80 percent of the workforce is back in the office and there's a few people who said hey i want to stay remote it does shift the dynamic back even mm -hmm. because yeah, you're right they're kind of isolated so it is it gives a good time for employers if they are going to do this and i think it's a wonderful thing that you're able to offer to kind of do the training or to say hey everybody had to do this when everybody was working from home but now that we have people in the workforce that are back in the office and some who stay remotely we still need to have practices in place from a supervisory standpoint in a right. communication standpoint that those don't feel left out right mm -hmm. exactly yeah exactly um, okay, so one of the things, and we'll kind of wrap up on the PPP loan, is that, um, as we know, this eight weeks is up, um, uh, the cover period or alternative cover period, whatever one you mm -hmm. decide to get from the PPP loan, once the eight weeks is up, not every employer is going to be able to retain all of their staff because they don't have the funds. Business may be back, not back to normal, still may be reduced. What, from an HR perspective, do they need to consider? Well, if, if uh, unfortunately they might be right back where they were in March and April, um, yeah. you know, just because they've got the loan and the eight with the eight weeks is going to be up, it doesn't mean the business is returned to normal, and yeah. and the, the clients and the customers are still coming in, and some businesses are still going to be under some type of restrictions potentially with the amount that they can open. So I, I think that they don't want to wait until the, I think employers need to kind of start thinking about that now and not wait until the eighth week and yeah. kind of start to take a look at okay now knowing that this this eight week period is over what tough decisions potentially do i have to make or how can i start shifting maybe some work or workload what do i need to do in order to try to to keep as many people as i can and keep them employed um right. but at the end of the day unfortunately we you might be just right, right back where you were and having to either furlough or lay people off and one of the challenges is, you know, if your eight week PPP loan is up at the end of June, the additional uh, um, unemployment from the feds yeah. is ending on July 31st. So mm -hmm. they might still get the, the UI from Florida, which is a max of 275, but that extra right. $600 is not gonna be sitting out there past July 31st. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a, a continuing challenge um, and I don't, you know, none of us really know is when, when does normal come back and what does that look like? And I, I think the, you know, the, the ramifications of this are going to be felt for months and months, you know, and December 31st, we're going to be still sitting here figuring out what we, what we need to do. No, that's a really good point. I know that there's definitely things that have been introduced in Congress from bills, even the HEROES Act has been paced, um, passed by the House, where they've talked about extending the PPP period longer than the eight weeks to allow people to have more time to spend the loan proceeds or perhaps get it, um, even they've talked about additional funding to keep employees on. And who knows, they might extend the federal unemployment. It's just a matter of waiting and seeing what happens at the congressional level and the presidential level, but we can't make the, you have to be thinking of what you know today and not right. um, be relying on what's passed here what's passed here until something is final and like you said until it's written don't believe it right right 100%. Mm -hmm. okay so let's talk about benefits for a second so there's been some new guidance from the irs related to health coverage elections and flexible spending accounts can you tell us a little bit more about that yes absolutely so normally when you are offering benefits health and dental vision whatever it happens to be um, employees will get an opportunity to enroll in those coverages as a new hire, usually after a waiting period, and then once a year during open enrollment. So what the IRS has now said is they put out some guidance that said, we, because of everything going on, we're gonna allow mid-year changes in elections if the employer chooses. 
So an employer has, they're driving, driving this car. An employer can decide to permit mid-year changes for other reasons for this year. So that if an employee, you know, because of the, the furloughed or maybe they have a spouse that was furloughed and all of these things, they can permit an employee to um, add coverage, delete health coverage, add dependents, change their health plan, which normally you couldn't do during the year. Um, and that is until December 31st. So that's one of the changes. On the flexible spending account for both the medical and the dependent care, care side, and again, it's, it's up to the employer to decide, but the employer can choose to permit employees to make changes to those flexible spending account, um, and how much they can either add, add an amount, they can revoke their election for their FSA, um, they can add or change the amount on their FSA, they can add their dependent account, it really depends. So for example, on the dependent care account, you know, I might have planned to spend X number of dollars this year in daycare, right. and now the daycare is closed. So right. the potential for me to lose money at the end of the year if I don't spend all of that is a little bit higher under these circumstances. So me as an employer, I can decide to allow employees to make changes and maybe take my my annual contributions to the dependent care from $5,000 to $4,000 because that's all I'm going to spend. The trick on the medical piece, on a medical flexible spending account, is the entire amount that the employee wants to contribute for the year is available on day one. So on January 2nd, if I put in $1,200 into a medical flexible spending account, on January 2nd, if I end up in the hospital, you already gave me my $1,200. You, the employer, already gave me my $1,200. But I might not, I might have only contributed about half that in by June, right? Yeah. So if you permit that kind of change, you would think, well, gosh, you know, I, I'm going to lose, me, employer is going to lose another $600 because the employee got reimbursed for 1200 though they've only only contributed 600 so there are some caveats in there that you can as an employer decide it's only up to the maximum amount that they they've already spent on it so if they can reduce it but they still have to you know it's going to be dollar for dollar return on that and there's some other kind of goofy rules in it i would encourage anybody who's considering making these changes to go to the irs website and look at the guidance because no matter what you decide to do, if you decide to make any of these changes to your section 125 or to your wrap documents, you have to do it in writing. And the changes have to be prospective. So you have to have that done before you can actually start permitting the changes. Um, otherwise you can run afoul of ERISA, which you don't want to do. So I would encourage any employer that's considering this or has employees that have questions and, uh, about wanting to make these changes, to start by looking at that guidance and learning a lot uh, more about what they're recommending or what the options are before making any kind of final decisions because there's going to be some legwork on the employer's part to make it happen remembering too that on the on the health side at least with health dental vision you know if there is there are already qualifying events that permit employees to make certain changes those still exist all this did was expand it to other reasons no, that makes sense. All right, so we're gonna um, switch to your favorite subject. I'm laughing, the SFCRA. <laughs> okay, so we've had so many questions and they continue to come in as even though this has been in place now for almost two months, but they continue to give guidance and new situations kind of come up. So one of the ones we've gotten a lot is that I furloughed my staff, but now I'm able to bring them back because I got the PPP loan. Will the FFCRA apply to rehired employees? Absolutely, absolutely, um, until December 31st, 2020. So yeah. if, they, if they went out and you brought them back in, depending on which side, whether it's the paid sick leave or the expanded F FMLA, as long as they worked their 30 days for expanded F FMLA, the day you bring them back, if they are sick with COVID, they are going to be eligible for the paid sick leave under the FFCRA. And um, that holds true whether whether you had them furloughed, whether you were kind of paying them some of their PTO while they were out, if you laid them off and you rehired them. So you've laid them off, you've taken them off payroll, and you've rehired them, also still eligible. One interesting thing that was just recently added in, the, in one of the frequently asked questions from the DOL was what that, and I have no idea how we would e you would even enforce this, but what they're saying is, that if somebody was working with company ABC 
and they used 80 hours, two weeks of paid sick leave, but then you hire them at company XYZ, then they can't have that 80 hours again. So if they got paid sick leave with the prior employer, they're not supposed to get it with you. But my question with that is how would you know? How would you know to be able to even enforce that? So if someone got expanded FMLA of six weeks under the old employer, they should now be eligible for only six weeks with you. But again, I, I have no idea how you would even enforce that unless you have an employee affirmatively let you know they already got it. And then you would make a decision, all right, well, I'm not gonna pay that twice. Yeah, that is really interesting because under the reporting for, you know, when you actually take the credit for giving them the expanded um, sick leave, you actually don't report that till after the quarter's end. You reduce your um, you reduce your taxes um, paid in by the amount that you paid the employee. So we know how that all works. But you actually don't report that on the 941 until after quarter end. So I would think, and even then it's not by employee. So that is very strange. It's not. Uh, yeah, so we'll see what they come out with of how to enforce this. Although I understand it, they don't want someone jump, jumping from job to job and getting paid every single time that the, apparently the government's paying for. But again, how will they enforce it? Yes. So how about when an employee wants to self-quarantine after self-diagnosing symptoms? So not going to a doctor of COVID-19. Are they eligible for the emergency paid sick leave? Not according to the guidance, they are not, unless okay they seek a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So if someone says, I just, I just, I, you know, I lost my taste bud, so I'm going to assume I have it and stay home for two weeks. They are not eligible for the paid sick leave. If they said, well, I've got, I lost my taste buds. I'm going to go seek a diagnosis. They go get tested. They get tested. The test is negative. It's only for that period of time that they actually would be eligible for paid sick leave. Once mm -hmm. they test negative, that's not, an, that's not a reason anymore. And they would either come back to work or if they stayed out would, because they're sick with something else, then they would need to use their own, their own sick leave, pay PTO or something like that. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So then the school year is now over. Hallelujah for those of us who have had kids at home to school. Does the employer still have the expanded FMLA requirements for childcare over the summer? Yes, they do. Um, that's become a real big issue right now um, because according to the guidance in the FFCRA, it's not just schools. It, it's a place of care, place of child care. So that includes daycare and it can include summer camps. And from what I've been hearing from, from people that, that have kids, either summer camps aren't opening, they're opening very limited, or they're going to be virtual summer camps, which means the kids are still going to be in the house. Right. So, um, so yes, the FFCRA and the the paid leave for childcare and the expanded FMLA for childcare would still apply over the summer if there's no alternatives. And again, it's always having to do that if there's, there's not an alternative to care. So if their normal place of care is closed, if their normal daycare center is closed and they have no options, then it would apply, yes. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. And I'll just tell you from like a personal standpoint where my kids normally go to different summer camps throughout the summer. So not a consistent childcare. How would I document that that childcare is not available? Unlike if I had sent them to, if they were in daycare and the daycare was closed, that's an easy, like, well, I say easy, but you can sh prove to your employer by daycare is closed. Is it just the, uh, the employee self-documenting that they don't have a place to send their kids? Yes, and I would add that they could probably say where they normally would. What was their plan? What right. was their plan for summer before all of this happened? And if it was go to X camp, then when you get them to certify that they need the time off, they have to put the name of the school or the place of care, and right. they need to state what that is. Because more than likely, you know, I mean, this did happen starting in March, but by March, most people are already thinking about what they're going to do for the summer with their kids. Right. Um, if they had some place that they sent them last year and they intended to do the same, if it was a school camp, it could still just be the school um, right. that is not going to have the camps over the summer. So they do need to identify where the, who or what the normal provider was gotcha. for the care. Yeah, no, that's a really good point because it is a little bit different as every summer of like what's going on and how yeah. you can get the documentation. And quite, quite truthfully, there could be camps that may reopen, but maybe they're at a limited capacity and they only right. are going to take 10 kids and they normally take 100. So it's kind of it's going to be a, a very interesting summer for all of those who are parents and trying to figure out what they can do with their kids. But on the flip side for employers, again, makes it a little bit more difficult. Yeah. So. 
Can an employee taking a take 12 work weeks of expanded FMLA in addition to their regular 12 weeks of leave under the original FMLA? That's a good one right there, 24 weeks. It, it, it's a really good question. The answer is no, it's an easy no. Um, oh. It's a total of 12 weeks in a, in a calendar year, regardless of the reason for the FMLA. So if someone um, had took two weeks of FMLA in January for surgery, then they would only have have the, the, the 10 weeks of the expanded FMLA and paid sick leave to use for the other. So it's a total of 12 weeks altogether. Um, no double, week. unfortunately. No double. Okay, right. very interesting. Um, can more than one guardian or um, I guess parent take paid sick leave or expanded FMLA simultaneously to watch the child whose school or place of care um, is closed due to COVID? And I know I've gotten that question a lot. Yeah, and it, it and the answer should be no, but I'll add add a caveat to that in a second. So if you have have two people that are at home, in mm -hmm. under normal circumstances, one or the other could be taking care of the child so that the other parent can go to work or telework. Right? right. Um, there would be some pretty significant circumstances where that's not the case, and that's possible. You know. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, the guidance says that if you have two people in the household that are capable of providing care, then it, then one or the other would be the would would stay home with the children. The other one would go go to work. Um, right. And I've I've heard a lot. That's what's happening a lot. It's like what they switch off days or they switch off weeks so that someone's home at all of the time. The caveat comes in is if you have both of the caregivers working for the same company. And that's where it gets a little bit more complicated because you have, you know, they're they're both they're, and if if it's not for if it's for a childcare reason, but one of them is coming in and one of them is high risk, then you might have an issue, right? So right. if you have two caregivers in the home, one wants to come to work, but the second one is high risk, or the child is high risk, or there's some other circumstances, it can get a little more difficult to make a determination of how you want to handle that. So I go back to right what I said at the beginning, which it needs to have an inter interactive conversation on how we're going to make this work so that the employer is hopefully getting what they need. You're providing what you're supposed to to the employees, but the employees are also helping you and working with you and you come to some agreement on an arrangement that's going to then it's going to work for everybody, hopefully. Yeah, I haven't heard of a lot of employees trying to take advantage of this where you've heard that both people are um, both parents or guardians or caregivers are staying home and getting the expanded FMLA. And quite truthfully, it's because they're not getting paid 100 percent. Right. So, not to their benefit um, to do that in in most cases so that's been a good but it has been a question yeah. okay so on the care under the switch to the cares act and we'll talk yeah. a little bit about unemployment so what is the latest we touched on this a little bit earlier about congress maybe perhaps extending the federal unemployment of the 600 dollars per week and what have you heard i've heard all sorts of different stories including now people getting overpaid on the federal unemployment yes. and getting multiple checks <laughs> and some people right. still getting their employment. So what is, what's the latest? Yeah, that would be the nice problem to get because I'm, I, you know, I mean, all you have to do is go on social media or go on Twitter and it's, it's really um, unfortunate that um, there are still a lot of people that are, that are waiting two months later who have not started to get paid. Um, I think that it's at least here in Florida, it's, it's definitely improved. People are starting to get some checks, but it's a little um, unpredictable on why they're getting this amount, but not this amount overpayments, underpayments, people are reporting overpayments, no payments, skipped weeks. And I think it's all indicative of the fact that they've got so many claims and now they're running two different systems. So the old system that just really couldn't accommodate anything. And then the new system, which is also overwhelmed, which the, the good news is I, I'm hearing that self-employed, independent contractors, people are start, they're starting to see their, their claims being processed and money coming in. Thank goodness, because we sat here at the last time we did this, nobody, no self-employed or ICs were actually getting paid yet. So there, there is progress being made. Um, patience is the name of the game, and it's incredibly frustrating for those that, that are still struggling with it. Um, some claim information is still kind of trickling out, um, still having issues with the website, but, um, but again, it, it has improved. But it's not perfect, and I don't know when we'll we'll ever get to perfect. You know, I think we just have to do the best we can with the system that we have in place now. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as we talked about before, 
you know, there is some talk about potentially extending it, but it's a little controversial too, because when, you know, the intent of that additional $600 was to put more money in people's pockets to be able to spend in the economy or pay their bills. But for a certain population of people, what it did, it, it disincentivized them potentially to want to return to work. So I'm right. hearing from employers that are, you know, they, they don't want to come back because they can make more money um, sitting on unemployment right now. So if that gets extended, that's just going to potentially multiply that problem in some people's eyes. Um, though others are saying, look, you know what, they, they needed to some assistance, the bills are still coming in, they weren't making much to begin with, and this is giving them some additional support. So, you know, I don't know if there's a right answer or a wrong answer to it. And I guess we'll see what Congress decides to do if they if they do decide to extend it, because if the 600 goes away, the, the normal Florida is 275 a week at a max. And right. that's, that's not a lot. It's one of the lowest in the um, in the country, actually. Yeah. And, you know, is there an employer, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, is there an employer responsibility if you rehire someone to let the state know you've rehired them or that you have a new employee? How does that work? Or if the employee is supposed to be reporting that. So what the employee is supposed to report any wages that they earn. So uh, they still have to go into, even if they start getting their unemployment checks, they have to go into the system every every week, every two weeks to claim their weeks. And when they claim their yeah. weeks, they have to report any income or if they've gotten um, they've gotten a, a full-time job or they've replaced their income. And if they don't, you can get into some pretty serious trouble if you don't do that. Yeah, I've heard, yeah, and I've actually heard a lot of misinformation about that where employees have tried to call and they said, well, the employer has to report, which there is apparently a, a way you can report it, but it's not required. There's a lot, a lot of information related to that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this whole thing kind of unwinds. Right. And yeah. then, yeah, and so then another thing that, and I'll, I'll just touch on this, is that if you do have um, a retirement plan in place and you do have the availability into the, um, the CARES Act to let employees take distributions from that, mm -hmm. um, without the early withdrawal penalty, which is something kind of different, again, with the warning to employees that if they do that, that's great for their, for their money, but making sure that they understand that they're still going to pay taxes on it, there's not a tax waiver on it, and obviously right. Seeing the retirement savings, but I know I've had um, people ask kind of about those different options. Again, yeah. we'll see where everything kind of comes and if there's additional legislation that's passed, um, what it kind of looks like as we navigate through the summer and this pandemic, um, hopefully really reduces and goes away or is not as bad as yeah. expected, or if we're kind of still um, talking about this in July, August, or hopefully not in December. Um, yes. because yeah, this is this has been a, a lot from an HR perspective for employers to have to digest mm -hmm. and try and navigate. So I really appreciate you dialing in with us and letting us know what you know today, right? It could all change. Exactly. So wait till next week, something different, right? <laughs> It will. And kind of a reminder to everybody, as I say at the end of every webinar, is that we do have a COVID-19 resource um, homepage on our website, www.jmco.com, um, where we try to keep it as up to date as possible with links to the DOL, OSHA, the IRS guidelines, as well as different articles um, and reminding people to be careful when Googling different um, opinions on things as some things pay attention to the dates because things are changing now less often. They used to change on like an hourly basis, but <laughs> they are still changing. And so you don't want to be reading some guidance um, or someone's article that was written, including ours on April 1st, before we knew even more information that would have come out that is much more relevant today. Right. And lastly, want to remind everybody as we um, shift to our weekly edition series, if there's topics or things that you would like us to address or talk about, please email us at info at jmco.com and let us know what you want to hear us talk about as we continue to hopefully bring you the latest and greatest from developments. But as hopefully the pandemic starts to wind down, there's not as much to talk about. We're, help, we're happy to help in any sort of way and giving you information we know from whether it's an HR perspective, a business perspective, a tax perspective, financial perspective, however that would work. So thanks, Julie, for joining us. And we yeah. look forward to seeing everybody next week.